a place for everything and everything in its place. How many times have we heard that? This holds true when it comes to frequency allocation. In other words, this means that you will find certain types of communications in certain parts of the spectrum. All units stand three. It now appears as though shots are being fired. All officers use caution. It has been confirmed. Suspects are armed and are firing at police. Welcome to Scanner School. My name is Phil Lichtenberger, and today we are talking about frequency allocation. I would like to welcome back David Vine to the podcast today. And David was last on back in February of 2023 in episode 269, where basically we just had a great conversation about the radio hobby in general. David is full of information, and he has done plenty of presentations through several different amateur radio groups on different things about radio. Dave is back today to talk about frequency allocations, where to find things, how things are organized, and how we can find information about why things are located in certain areas. I look forward to having David on in future podcast episodes. And uh, again, I can't say enough good things about David, and I'm very happy to have him back on the podcast today. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into today's conversation with David. Dave, thank you again for coming back on the podcast. The first time you were on, I had a blast, and I'm pretty sure everybody who was listening definitely took a, a lot away with them. So to have you come back and to share more information about some of the topics that you've um, that you prepared for other other outlets and other talks, I'm I'm very happy that you're uh, coming back here to share that information with the Scanner School community. So, David, Absolutely. thanks for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Phil, it's really a pleasure chatting with you. I, I There's no one else that I know that I can talk to like who's knowledgeable like you are. So I enjoy it. It's a pleasure for me. But great. we have a topic for tonight. Which is great. What are we talking about? We're talking about essentially how do radio frequencies get assigned? Beautiful. And it seems like well, you know, that's a pretty simple thing. The FCC does it, right? You know, they just decide what they're going to do. Well, just like everything else, the magic is behind the curtain because there is there's an enormous amount of activity. And it's, it's unbelievable. It depends on where you want to stop looking, you know. Mm -hmm. But obviously, in the old days, you know, it was to avoid chaos in the broadcast area. Now they've gotten way past organizing and allocating. In fact, uh, it's been quite a while, but they, they, they're calling it a, a precious resource, even oh, more is. so today. Yeah, oh, 100% is a precious resource because it, it's, there's only so much of the RF spectrum that's available. And uh, I mean, you know more than anybody else too, right? There's certain parts of the spectrum that have that people lobby to get or acquire and there's certain parts of the spectrum that you and I use that's not generating any money for anybody that people can look at and say well that's wasted spectrum it's happened on the 220 band but um, you look at some of the TV providers right the C band satellite is being told at this point to move their downlink frequencies because cell phone carriers are now grabbing the C band spectrum and and when you look at some of the spectrum, that's where it gets its name from, right? C band, uh, UHFT, because that was the UHF TV band. So, uh, so yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of organization, a lot of organized chaos, and a lot of the bands also. Well, so, it's competition for spectrum slots, oh, totally yeah. particularly above one one gigahertz. But do you know about? I mean, obviously you have pagers, which I guess is a digital form of communication, but. Above, it seems to me, and, and you give me your impression, it seems to me that data is generally above one gigahertz. I mean, commercial data, you know, like the Wi-Fi, 5 and 2.4, 5 uh, gigahertz, and God, I don't know what 6G uh, is going to go to. Do you have any idea about that? 
No idea, but it'd be it's going to at least start off on the available spectrum. That's a you know that's out there because again, uh, you know, one G, two G, three G, four G, five G at this point have all been on the same frequencies that's always been out there. There's no difference on frequency use uh, with the initial rollout of five G. It's you know now that we're starting to get more frequencies and nanometer and stuff like that that things change. But um, but you're right though. It's a lot of data up on the higher bands. A lot of that is because you can have fatter pipes, right? More bandwidth on each frequency and the frequencies go, they don't go as far. So you can reuse them over a smaller footprint without stepping on anybody else who has to be using it. But um, I, mean, I guess, you know, going back to, I know we have a lot to talk about, but uh, you say digital, right? And we could talk telemetry too. We can wrap that in there as well. And there's a lot of telemetry down on the VHF low band. Um, oh, yeah. Originally with the old... Um, you know, like like paging downlink or paging links were on 72 megahertz. You've got some telemetry down at 39 megahertz with some water meters or or stuff like that. So there's a lot of a lot of old, you call it old school, slow digital, but you're right. A lot of the newer digital stuff that's uh, getting megabits and gigabits of um, use on it. You're right. 2.4 gig, 5.8 gig. Um, and I think there's even another uh, split now that's rolling out, at least here in the States, right? There's uh, Wi-Fi is 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 the most, um, I, I guess at this Commonly point, used. the biggest use of it yeah. next to cell phones. Yeah, So absolutely. Now, so if we have these frequencies being assigned, which they are, and most people think, oh, well, you know, CFCC, right? Well, it's not so simple. And in fact, it actually brings up a... A point that I'm a pretty strong supporter of, and that is national sovereignty. You know, countries are sovereign. They, you know, it's people associate that with the word king, but it's not. It just means that we are a nation and we have our own laws and regulations and we have customs and mores and all kinds of things. But the ITU which is the International uh, Telecommunications Union, is really, they sit on top of the pyramid. And it's kind of, well, sort of timely that we're talking about this because I believe it's December in somewhere in the Middle East. They're going to have the World Radio Communication Conferences. And, uh, you know, that is where a lot of things get decided. And then because we, as a nation, are a treaty signee. In other words, we've signed a treaty mm -hmm. with the ITU to follow certain procedures, you know? And so consequently, if you start to dig down into the frequencies, you'll see the, ta the table of allocations. And on one, there's a whole column for ITU. And then there's the right column is for the U.S., so, you know, there's a lot. And by the way, in terms of data, you're probably looking at the people who are probably most interested in data are the SDR users because they're more technically inclined. They're, they have access to all kinds of software to decode things, uh, et cetera. But mm -hmm. I would say probably what, 85, 90 percent of your visitors are really just interested in voice. Does that sound about right? It sounds about right. But when you start thinking about things too, what is P25? What is DMR, right? Oh, what is yeah. NXDN? It's not a voice path. It's actually data. Correct. Yep. Correct. Okay. So you have the ITU and basically they have three uh, main divisions. One's the telecommunications development sector. That means giving money and expertise to poorer nations uh, telecommunication standardization sector. That's kind of nebulous, you know, but I don't really don't know much about those two. But the radio communication sector, which is referred to as ITU hyphen R as in Romeo, and we're talking about uh, India Tango Uniform hyphen Romeo, ITU dot, uh, dot dash R. So they have these conferences, and they're held every three to four years. They review and revise radio regulations. Mm -hmm. And this will probably be the year, too, they decide to, to uh, sunset AM broadcast radio, too, right? 
I don't know. Uh, Have you been keeping up with that? No, I've heard a little bit, but tell me about it. So, uh, yeah, so some car manufacturers have decided they're not putting AM radios inside their vehicles. So there's a lot of speculation as to why that might be, because it might be because, you know, some of these EVs, they generate too much of an RF field or too much electrical noise that interfere with the radios. Other people say that because over in Europe, they've already kind of canned AM broadcast over there anyway. So they're, they're saying, well, why bother adding that to vehicles? I just recently read this week that Ford, apparently they, they know what you're listening to on your radios because you sign away when you buy the car, basically, that you know when you use, I guess, in your Chevys or whatever else you've got, what's that, uh, OnStar still. But I think Ford's got some sort of telemetry thing that they have set up too that tells you, you know, on your phone when it's time to get an oil change or your tire pressure's low. But I think part of that is the fact that they know what type of sanitized, I would say, what type of what radio stations you're listening to. And they've said that 20%, only, only 20% of their users or their car owners are listening to AM radio. So it, it is part of this whole big thing now to remove AM radio from vehicles, which will be pretty sad to see, to be honest with you. I know my car is a 2011 and the AM side of the radio went toes up on me for some reason. And I was all bent out of shape until the local AM broadcast station here that I like to listen to is now simulcast on an FM radio station. So I can listen to them again. But um, it seems yeah, like well, it, it is it is much better. I, I remember probably at least 15 years ago, I hmm. was driving up Route 1 in New Jersey trying to listen to WCBS News Radio 88. Mm -hmm. And every half mile or so, I would get this drown out from probably transformers, but I could not listen to the AM. Right. And that's part of what people are saying. Like, it's just better on FM because, you know, it, it just sounds better and it, it doesn't fade out and whatnot. But um, I, I believe there's something that runs on the background of AM for as far as not national defense, but I think it's the national like alert system or, or something. They said that uh, well, AM there's radio is important to that, right? It's called iPaws, but uh, iPaws covers everything. You know, okay. it starts with no weather radio and then goes into all the electronics and cable systems, et cetera. Gotcha. But anyway, so the word stakeholders becomes mm -hmm. very important. You know, they have agendas and details, but what they do is they, in between, and we're talking three or four years in between these things, they have conferences and meetings and, uh, you know, and all kinds of things going on. Uh, hundreds of committees in different areas, you know, just, but the word stakeholder is increasingly important. And that means it's not a stockholder, but it's somebody who really has an interest in what's going on. Somebody with a vital interest, like equipment manufacturers, mm -hmm. when, when you think about it. I mean, they're, they're going to build equipment. They want to build more equipment. Consequently, they're going to be lobbying for whatever it is that they build, you know, the frequencies mm -hmm. or additional frequencies for, you know, for that use. Right. And again, we can talk about how that, you know, there's, there was the mother M basically didn't want to do low band anymore. They didn't want to make equipment for that. So they, they said, well, I'm getting out of that business and forcing everybody to do the same that wanted to buy a new radio. There's other manufacturers that said, we're always going to stick around on low band because we see there's a need there. But, you know, somebody tried to flex their muscles and say that this is where we're going to go now. And, yeah. uh, you know, the same thing you said, you know, manufacturers, they want to build equipment. There's got to be the standard and the stakeholders need to all be in line, especially for, the flexibility of buying generic equipment or equipment that's going to be able to plug and play into each other with protocols. I'm sure we're going to talk about all the different protocols or at least interconnectivity between well, equipment, right? Yeah. What, one of, for instance, okay, one of the stakeholders is the Broadcast and Media Industry Association. So it's an international trade association for people who are in manufacturing and sales of equipment to the broadcast industry. You have the DMR Association, okay? Digital mm -hmm. Mobile Radio. These are the people who develop the standards and promulgate it in their equipment and consultants, anybody that has a financial interest in DMR. 
But then you have a user group like the International Amateur Radio Union. The DMR Association represents people who make digital mobile radios, you know, and the, 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 the format for DMR. You have the P25 people. I mean, they're all, mm -hmm. they all have groups and associations now. And we're, we're working our way to public service because that's where it seems to me it becomes really intense. And there's so many different stakeholders and uh, people clamoring for money in that field in terms of grants. But in any case, you've got a whole bunch of different conferences and committees with the ITU. Then you have the FCC, of course. So everybody knows about the FCC. I mean, they're the people who regulate. Now, they're a commission. Mm -hmm. they're, that's a kind of a special governmental entity. It's a commission. You know, these things really do make it make them. They're important. Now, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration is part of the executive branch, okay? They manage the spectrum for the federal government, the civil side of federal government, and the military. So these are the people who are fighting. They're, they're actually sort of, I wouldn't say an opponent of the SEC, but they, they don't have the same interests as the FCC. The FCC is interested in all kinds of things. They want to push technology. They want to get, they want to, you know, do all kinds of things politically. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think uh, they kind of re more report to Congress, but the NTIA, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, that's under the Department of Commerce, which means it's part of the executive branch. So, you know, they ultimately report to the president. Now, regulations and procedures for federal regulation for radio frequency management. Federal regulations for radio frequency management. So in 884 pages, they give a rundown on how the federal government uses RF spectrum. You know, it's, uh, by the way, the document I have in front of me says, this order is unclassified, which hmm. begs the question of, well, what kind of classified <laughs> orders do they have? Yeah, where's part two? <laughs> where's the second yeah. half of that, right? <laughs> well, you know, I, I just, when I, thought up this topic, I, I thought to myself, people just go to their source for frequencies and they mm -hmm. either import the frequencies or they use uh, radio reference, which is very, very convenient. But very probably little thought is given to how those frequencies are assigned. And I think it's important for your listeners to know that just like you can go to the FCC and look at what they do, I think the big difference between the FCC and the NTIA is the NTIA does not have a searchable database. No. Okay, you, you can go to the FCC that is man, managing the civil and commercial side of the spectrum. You can go there and look at everything. I mean, anything you want to see, it's there. But the NTIA... Not so much. Right. There, there is in the table of allocations, which is what the FCC has on their site, there are frequencies that are set aside for government use. And if, if your listeners have not, or if some of your listeners haven't seen the uh, spectrum chart, you know what I'm referring to, right? That Correct. giant yep. wall chart. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's incredibly complex, especially the higher you go in frequency, it, it becomes very uh, little tiny slivers of allocations, you know, and it's just amazing how many different slivers they've cut it up into. But these are the three things I would recommend that your, your listeners make sure they're familiar with the database system on the FCC site. Number two. Get the NTIA manual for 2022. Download it. It's free. 
and just look through it. You know, maybe just look at the uh, table of contents and see if there's anything interesting. Okay. But the other thing that they're very much involved in, and this, this kind of mirrors what's going on with the uh, FCC, they're big into emergency preparedness. Now, we're talking NTIA, but actually both agencies. And for instance, the FCC has a major program going with um, utilities, uh, both the, well, I shouldn't say utilities, but the telephone company, service providers, both wireline and wireless, okay, they have a system. It's called a disaster management system, I believe. And uh, I don't believe you can search any of those records, but, you know, they manage outages, in other words, if there's an outage, like from a big disaster like Katrina or something, mm. I guess previously they never really had a handle on what was going on. Somebody would – they'd be on the phones talking with somebody. But now it's all in a big database, and all of the uh, cell service providers you know, have to um, – have to comply correct yeah you have to report if there's an outage x number of pops and stuff like that so yeah it does become very important to know what services are up or down so yep well in emergency preparedness that's where it becomes really very interesting one of the things that i'm sure your some of your listeners or most of your listeners probably know about is first net f-i-r-s-t-n-e-t -E well first net is a wireless internet or you know wireless networking so to speak service but it's a second internet and it is a private internet for uh, law enforcement and emergency management people and i guess government at some level i mean in terms of local you know the mayor i'm sure if he wanted to well in fact they do the fcc issues what's called GETS, which is uh, Government Emergency Telecommunications Service. And these are actually like, I guess, like a credit card, but it's a card. You get it. It's got a procedure for overriding the regular system. Now, exactly what the procedures are, uh, they're probably public, but I've never really looked at it. But that's why I say it starts to get interesting because FirstNet is completely a wireless system. I believe it's on 700 megahertz, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I can't uh, really speak too much about FirstNet since I'm kind of involved with it. <laughs> so I have to watch where I chime in and what I say. But uh, Oh, oh, okay. So you know yeah. about it. I know very, very, yeah. I, I, okay. I, part of my nine to five is involved with FirstNet. So let's put it okay. that way. But you're right. right. The, the spectrum that was allocated to the wireless provider here in the U.S. that won the first net contract, those frequencies are in the 700 megahertz band. That's correct. Okay. Okay, let's take a quick break right here in this conversation that Dave and I are having to just remind you that if you are a Patreon supporter at a $3 a month level, you will get this podcast earlier than our weekly release schedule. You'll also get it without this upcoming break. So if you want to help support the podcast, please go to scannerschool.com slash Patreon. Safecom. Tell me what you know about Safecom. You, I'm sure you know more than I do. <laughs> tell me what you can tell me. No, not really. <laughs> you can go ahead with this one. Yeah, this, is being, this is something I'm going to learn right here. So go ahead. Well, Safecom is a, quote, public safety stakeholder-driven program sponsored by CISA, C-I-S-A. Do you know that term? No. CISA is now a huge department, or I should say division. I'm not sure if that's the exact nomenclature for them, but CISA is a unit of the Department of Homeland Security, and they are now... <laughs> Everything having to do with telecommunications, elect communications by electronics, wireless, everything, all of that, the security, the whole thing, plus all of the law enforcement systems and integration and all that, it is now under a giant organization within the Department of Homeland Security, which is uh, CISA. And uh, 
I wish I had spelled these out. I usually do. Anyway, and now is where, you know, stakeholders, uh, it really comes to the fore because you're talking about emergency communications grants, mm -hmm. a list of federal financial assistance programs for funding emergency communications. And when you look at that, it is a very long list. Okay, so I'm on the Department of Homeland Security website right now. Oh, wait a minute. It says www.cisa, Charlie India Sierra Alpha dot gov. So it's it's not really it's supposed to be part of the uh, DHS, but it looks like they're getting bigger and bigger. Anyway, if you go to their list of federal financial assistance programs funding emergency communications, you're going to see a page with at least dozens and maybe close to 100 different programs. Now, that's just funding. The grants are a whole other thing emergency communications grants. So you can see how much money is being allocated, spent, whatever you want to call it, in this field. So obviously the equipment manufacturers and the service providers, they're sitting there at the sidelines licking their chops, which is fine. I mean, you know, I have an MBA. I'm not against business. I'm not against profit. But um, in the case of some of it, it's kind of a monopoly. I mean, AT&T has a, a monopoly with FirstNet, but be that as it may, you have the National Council of Statewide Interoperability Coordinators. So that's another group that makes sure that the frequencies that are assigned, the, that are allocated, and now we're talking primarily about the trunking systems. And that's by the way, all of this has come about, in my personal opinion, it's come about because of 9-11, because the firefighters, the police, they couldn't talk to each other. There were problems communicating. It was a mess. Mm -hmm. And so they had the 9-11 um, the commission, and I converted the entire text of the reports into an audio file and spent many hours listening to that while I was on the road. Oh, wow. But in any case, there's a lot of money in public safety telecommunications. There are a lot of different organizations. You look at the National Public Safety Telecommunications Council, and there are two categories. You have members, you have associate members, but then the other category is liaison and affiliate organizations. So really, it's a council. It's like almost probably like the UN, you know, or the General Assembly is the council of all the countries. So everybody that has an interest in the public safety telecommunications is represented. Let's just look at the uh, associate members list here. Oh, yeah. I mean, first of all, the governing board and these are the voting associations, are everything from the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, the American Radio Relay League, Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. It goes all the way down the list alphabetically to the National Sheriff's Association. You know, International Association of Fire Chiefs, uh, Emergency Managers, this, that, and the other thing. Then we have... You know, the Utilities Technology Council, they're an associate member of this. And the public safety, you know, they, they have multiple agencies. It used to just be APCOA, mm -hmm. but now uh, they've changed their name. And it's, um, you know, it's, you know, they represent themselves as being international. But they have li liaison and affiliate organizations everything from the Alliance for Telecommunications Industry Solutions to govern uh, Government Wireless Technology and Communications Association. Okay, get that, an association for government, Government Wireless Technology and Communications, the Open Mobile Alliance, which is probably uh, open source software people. Then you have uh, Project 25 Technology Interest Group, 
So those are the folks that are pushing P25 technology. Safer Buildings Coalition, they would like to get money to put, I would imagine, they would like to get money to put repeaters inside buildings. Uh, you know, these are probably major owners of office buildings. Right. Yep. And I mean, that's that's exactly what it is. You know, it sounds like it's, um, think about it. You walk into a, a building in the city, right, or a hospital, and, and all of a sudden now you can't talk to the outside world, right? Because yeah. you walked into to the triage center or the emergency room. Or you walked upstairs because there's somebody you need to keep eyeballs on. You can't talk to now somebody who's in a lobby, right? It, there's there's a lot of stuff out there now that's that, you know that, that's what you're saying. There's a lot of wireless out there, and and uh, it does require a lot of organization to make sure that everybody can play in this limited size sandbox that we have called our spectrum. Yeah. Well, there's a group here that I've never even heard of, the Critical Communications Association. And the Critical Communications Association, I don't know much about them. And then there's the Telecommunications Industry Association. So who's at the top of the pile there? Take one guess, Motorola. <laughs> All right. Then you have Realm Wireless. Whoever heard of Realm? I, well, maybe you have. It's a name that's familiar. Yep. Yeah. Well, you know, these are infrastructure people. These are the people that build the the technology that enables repeaters. Mm -hmm. It, you know, of course, Motorola, I think, does it all. But there are oh. other businesses. In fact, there's a ton of businesses. Exactly. And, and there's the thing, too. Right. So let's look at it from a different perspective a little bit. Because uh, because you, you were saying before, right? You've got the associations. You've got basically like the DMR has got I forget the name for it, but there's um. It's like the DMR association, the NXDN not association, but they have their other other name for it. But these are digital technology, right? So there has to be a protocol that follows it. There's got to be a, a language that's spoken across different manufacturers to allow things to work. There's certain types of features or or ways of doing things that allow radios to talk to the infrastructure that allows the repeaters to talk to other repeaters that allows it to talk to the computer system, that allows it to talk to this. But not only that, but you have to make sure you've got hardware that allows these types of transmissions to go through things. So you have to have the right combiners or diplexers or quadplexers or whatever it is that you're going to be funneling RF through, whether it be a community repeater system that has several different frequencies going into a community receiver or, or transmit antenna. So there's a lot on the line before the very first system is tested in a lab, right? Everything, the, the protocol has to be there. The programming language has to be there. The, the radio's operating system needs to be able to do certain things when the server tells it to do things. There are a lot more like cell phones, like first, second generation cell phones than they are radios these days because they hand off between sites. They go where a computer tells it to go to, you know, between man down and uh, emergency buttons and all these different features. I mean, some some radios have GPSs built into them, right? The, the programming has to be there for that. And uh, again, talking about with public safety, you look at, we just had here in the city too, right? We had a parking garage collapse. And what does the FDNY bring out? They bring out their Doberman rovers or, or robots, right? These these are four legged robots that are painted with uh, painted white with black spots on them, and, and they they go walking through the rubble. It's wow. and how does that work? Right, wireless is is got to be a certain part of the spectrum that not only can they control these robots on, but there's a link somewhere else, whether it be through FirstNet or through some of other backhaul that they're seeing video on. I mean, even drones, they had drones flying around for other things too. And they're going to be using drones here on Long Island in the summertime, I, I just found out today, when they're doing shark sightings. So everything has got to, you know. What like sightings? Say, I'm sorry. Sharks. Oh, shark. Yep. As in big fish with fins. As, as, in, as in the big fish with the fins. Exactly. Jaws. <laughs> so, yeah, there was a couple of shark sightings on uh, – a couple of beaches here last year and you know they had to so where where do you okay on the traditional public safety bands 
Mm -hmm. Who gets the word first? I guess out on Long Island, they must have some kind of big group that that like governs all the, uh, you know, the lifeguards and everything. Now, how, how would you hear about a shark sighting through a scanner? I'm curious. So it depends where you are down here because uh, State PD, I believe, has encrypted the beach conversations last I remember. But um, there are other lifeguards that work on VHF conventional. I know Nassau PD flies in the, flies a helicopter, but they're they're completely encrypted. There's no way to find out from there. But looking at some other systems that are out there, a lot of the lifeguards on other systems, like down the Jersey Shore, I believe, I even think down the some of the Viper systems, I'm probably wrong on that one, but there's lifeguards on the trunk system. So I would think you listen to that. Another resource for sure would definitely be the U.S. Coast Guard. Because you're going to want the Coast Guard to announce, right? Hey, don't jump off yeah. your boat in, in Jones Inlet because, well, it wouldn't be a shark on that side of it. But I'm just, as an example, right? Within the vicinity of this beach or that beach or between this buoy and that buoy, there, there was a shark sighting. So definitely don't go out on your jet ski. So yeah. I, w- I would think you'd find out from there for sure would be out on the uh on the You Coast probably Guard. have some broadcast stations that actually have roving reporters or some kind of uh you know outpost on the beaches yeah, well, not, or at least not on some AM of the major anymore. areas this <laughs> say again said not on am anymore right <laughs> <laughs> if you give your you know to to really see the complexity of this thing uh, just mm-hmm. just just in the public safety telecommunications and remember this is one unit of all yes. these stakeholders, all right? But we can look at all of the stakeholders within that one unit on this uh, NPSTC, which I believe is uh, National Public Safety Telecommunications Council, okay? It's a council. So that means that it doesn't have individual members. It has association and groups as members. So there is a NPSTC, that's no uh, November Papa Sierra Tango Charlie organizational chart. And you might even put this in your, you know, your show notes links, but you can see that there are all kinds. Well, first there's a little box to the left of the main box. The governing board of organizations is a bunch of public sector organizations, including ARRL. That's first I've heard of that, but yeah, there they are. So ARRL is smack dab on the govern in the middle on the governing board of organizations, and that's one of the organizations. And then to the left, you have liaison organizations, and that's where the FCC, FEMA, NTIA, all kinds of SafeCom program, USDOI, Department of Interior, USDOJ, and the University of Melbourne comps, whatever that is. I don't know. Yeah. Then you have an associate organization or two of them, which I mentioned before, the te- uh, the uh, Utilities Telecommunications Council. You have other affiliate organizations. And then below that, you have uh, outreach support and executive task force. And then below that, you have an interoperability committee. You have a spectrum management committee and a technology and broadband committee. So to what you were saying before about all these different behind the scenes, back office stuff, here in the spectrum management committee, they're particularly concerned about GPS interference and 911 location accuracy and in building communications. What the heck is the T band? The T band would be uh, the old UHF TV band. Okay. So, so well, you're looking at uh, channel, the you know, that channel 14 to 20, 20 what? 20, 20 something, right? Megahertz. Yeah, because I because we're looking because I'm just trying to think of the top of my head because I know where I am, we have we have stuff in UHF T band and again UHF T band was was allocated for busy right cities right Chicago New York LA busy hubs that needed more spectrum, and you can only use certain spectrum that was given to you to use by the FCC so you couldn't interfere with the TV channel so for example 
we have channel 21 here, right? So in UHFT band, you would, you would use, I think, channel 19 and 20 where I'm, where I'm located. And in another part of the country, you'd use channel 22 and 23, whatever it is. But what's interesting, though, David, is when you get skip, and it happens here all the time, the UHF trunk system that used by the county gets slammed by out-of-market uh, UHF TV stations that are now on the same spectrum as the trunk system. And it causes all sorts of problems. So the county is now, they just, you know, they rolled out this wow. UHFT trunk system and now they're investing in 700 megahertz and they shut down their EDAC system two or three years ago at this point and have now relaunched P25 up there. But they're still managing this as individual layers. It's 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 amazing what they're they're trying to do with the resources that are available to them. They got more resources, I think, than they know what to do with. But yeah, the, the T bands uh, is quite interesting. So to back up and look at the overview again before we ring off here, the important thing for your listeners is to understand the big picture. And when you look at frequencies, they're not just little numbers that just stick into your scanner. Uh, there's a lot behind it. And uh, I think, you know, I'm just the kind of guy that likes to see the big picture. And I'm sure there are many of your listeners that want to understand more about how these radio frequencies are assigned. All right. Well, I'm really sorry to say we had to abruptly end the conversation. For some reason, the Zoom connectivity between David and I was kind of starting to go south pretty quick. So we weren't able to do a traditional sign off and thank you with it. But uh, David and I, we definitely made sure we said our goodbyes privately. David, I'm really looking forward to having you back on the podcast again, and hopefully we can do it sometime soon. I really want to thank you for putting the presentation together. And uh, again, I want to apologize for having to quickly abrupt the conversation you and I are having. I know we could have gone for a little while longer as well. Now, if you want to be a guest on the podcast, again, you can tell this is just a conversation, right? You can go to scannerschool.com slash podcast and fill out the calendar, and I will have you on as a guest on the podcast. Before we wrap up this week's podcast, I want to take a minute here to thank all of our Patreon supporters. Alan Gonzalez, Arthur Altrack, Arthur Heron, Bill Kay, Bob Robs, Bob Middleton, Brandon Sammons, Brian King, Chris Paris, Classic Hank, Craig Harper, Dan, Daniel Chiavolella, Dave Pasco, David, David C., David Kuzneski, Denny Crotty, Dylan Heider, Ed Walsh, Edward Bramlett, Glenn Davos, Glenn Wright, Greg Johnson, I Hate Junk Mail, Jack Haycock, Jacques Berry, Jake Jacobson, James Broxson, James Felling, Jay Reed, Jeff Block, Jeff Chapman, Jeff McLeod, Jeff Waldrop, Jenny Taylor, Jim B., Jim Heinrich, John Kordoff, John John Keel, John Sweeney, John Derby, John Goldenberg, Joshua Robb, Ken Newberry, Kenneth Fowler, Kevin Zwicky, Lenny Bauer, Les Stevenson, Lloyd R., Luke Hartnett, Mark Beebe, Mason Kramer, Michael Gorman, Michael Kroger, Michael Meadows, Mike Lopez, Mike Piltz, Nicholas Stenger, Paul Bowling, Paul Teal, Randy Young, Raymond Hill, Rich Palmieri, Ronnie Box, Scott Lefgren, Thomas Giampino, Todd Glendie, and William Arcand. Find out more about Patreon and our support tiers by visiting scannerschool.com slash Patreon. Thanks again for listening. We'll catch you again next week. 73.